What's good? It's Wood. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel if you love music like I do. The Weeknd just announced that he is releasing his fifth studio album, Dawn FM. This is the follow-up to After Hours. After Hours was one of the best albums of 2020. It made a lot of the best of 2020 year-end lists. And, you know, as commercially successful as his second official album, Beauty Behind the Madness, is being his most successful album to date in terms of total sales and the two singles, The Hills and Can't Feel My Face from Beauty Behind the Madness. Like that was his most monstrous album. But After Hours from 2020, you could argue, is his best all around album to date from song to song to song. Phenomenal album, very slept on. I thought that it should have been up for more Grammys. I thought it should have been uh, positioned higher on the critical, like Metacritic, aggregating all of the different best of 2020 lists for, across publications. I thought that it should have been higher there. I mean, just very nuanced in terms of like the style clashes and so forth. But, you know, as The weekend is about to drop this Don FM album, which is again, his fifth official album, even though he had the mixtapes in the beginning and then he had that EP in between Starboy and After Hours, uh, the Dear Melancholy EP or My Dear Melancholy EP. But I just want to highlight that we are basically witnessing history right now in terms of one of the most improbable stretches and just runs of album by album, song by song, quality and just overall hotness. Do you know that it's now 10 years or just over 10 years? We're going into 11 years since he dropped that first House of Balloons mixtape. Like I remember hearing that thing and just hearing how his falsetto came in on High Like This, the album opener. And I was like, damn, this dude sounds a little bit like Michael Jackson. Like, you know how Michael Jackson has a flair for the dramatic when he gets into his falsetto? The Weeknd has that gift. Abel McConan Tesfe is his actual name, Ethiopian brother. But yeah, that House of Balloons mixtape, I mean, the genre bending. So basically, he introduced a level of darkness to the beats, making them more ominous. At the time, he was working with uh, Jeremy Rose, who basically had to wait a while to get credits when he reissued, he being The Weeknd, reissued those three mixtapes. It was House of Balloons, Thursday, and then Echoes of Silence. He re-released that as a compilation called Trilogy, and only then was the producer of some of those some of the best tracks on that first House of Balloons, mi Balloons mixtape. Jeremy Rose was finally credited for songs like Loft Music. Loft Music is the one that takes from the song Gila, G-I-L-A, from the second Beach House album, Devotion. Loft Music was one of my favorite songs on that House of Balloons mixtape, along with uh, Wicked Games, uh, The Morning, the song House of Balloons. But the song, like the closer called The Knowing, actually took from uh, Cocteau Twins or Cocteau Twins, Cherry Colored Funk. That's one of my favorite dream pop songs, period. So him and his producers, like Ilangelo, for instance, they obviously were tapping into basically harnessing some of the dream pop of the past and present and then bringing some of the trip hop, like kind of that darker, like Portis head sound and so forth. Or in the case of the title track, House of Balloons, uh, they sampled Susie and the Banshees, 1980 single, Happy House. So uh, it, he used and was influenced by a lot of these dream popish and a lot of these different genres, not too dissimilar from Drake, by the way, in that regard, both from Toronto, in fact, between Drake's uh, de official debut, major label debut, Thank Me Later, and uh, Take Care, he basically, you know, blogged about The Weeknd and ended up, you know, featuring him on several songs on that Take Care album, uh, featured him on his, at his OVO fest to where, you know, the saying OVO XO was a thing, OVO being Drake's label, XO being The Weeknd's label. You know, they kind of had a, a partnership going uh, of sorts where they frequently collaborated like on the song Crew Love from Take Care. But I was talking about the genre influence 
on the weekend's music, how it made it more ominous, but also more dreamy and darker. He was able to do this without sounding too derivative. Like his music doesn't sound like the music that he's sampling or influenced by. He has clearly kind of carved out his own vibe. And if you re-listen to House of Balloons, you know, we kind of had a feeling then when it dropped, but it was kind of a sign of things to come in terms of the direction that R&B, or at least that variation of R&B was about to take, kind of developing a dark wave because there are also new wave influences in the weekend's music. So if you listen to like his latest album, uh, After Hours, you could hear the strong new wave influence in like the hottest song, you know, the biggest song from the album, Blinding Lights. I mean, that would be a beautiful, you know, new wave song. It would be like that, what was it, Take Me Home by AHA or something like that when you hear the instrumentation. Basically the production style and then the way that uh, Abel's voice layers on top of the beat. There's nothing else like it in music. It's quite a remarkable thing. I remember seeing him for the uh, first and I mean to this day only time live. I was at Coachella. Uh, in fact, him and Frank Ocean both had sets on the same day, I believe. This was like 2011, 2012 maybe. But yeah, The weekend obviously opened his show with the song High for This. And there was like a lot of Coachella-based discussion on who's hotter uh, as an artist, The weekend or Frank Ocean? Because this is the year before Frank Ocean dropped Channel Orange, I believe. Like this is when he was just coming out with that Nostalgia Ultra mixtape. And then The Weeknd just had basically House of Balloons. And I think he was about to release the second of those three early mixtapes Thursday. But yeah, so he releases those three mixtapes. They all do well and his reputation is growing. He re-releases them as a compilation called Trilogy. And then he has his first official album called Kiss Land. And this was in 2013. I remember liking that one too. It, you know, peaked at number two on the US charts. So he's already obviously on the map. The album went gold. And then two years later, he dropped Beauty Behind the Madness. And that's when all hell broke loose with the hills, can't feel my face. His career basically took a turn from being like the kind of mysterious, cool, new shiny object in music, which, I mean, there always is. There's always like that next thing where people are still trying to wrap their head around and figure out, right? Well, by the time he dropped Beauty Behind the Madness in 2015, this is four years after House of Balloons, his career basically just launched. That was a, a number one album. It's gone like over five times platinum. Again, those two hits, The Hills and Can't Feel My Face, were his first and second number one songs. And around that same time, a song that's not even featured on the album uh, earned it. It was from the 50 Shades of Grey soundtrack. And he was actually nominated for like Academy Awards with that song, earned it from 50 Shades of Grey. Again, it wasn't on the Beauty Behind the Madness album, but he like won a Grammy for best R&B performance with that song. So yeah, he dropped earned it around the same time. He dropped that Beauty Behind the Madness album. And so again, this just launched him into the stratosphere to where his follow-up to Beauty Behind the Madness came like just uh, a year later with Starboy. Starboy also hit number one, so uh, sold a few million, and then four years later is when he dropped that After Hours album, which again, I think might be it might actually be his best album. Again, I still have the nostalgia and the love for House of Balloons because it's always just going to have a place in my heart. The way that that hit me, you know, this was a 2011, damn, 11 years ago. And just like the impression that it, that it made with me, my family and friends, where it's like, damn, who the hell is this weekend? And how is he sounding so ethereal and so majestic while having that Michael Jackson-like tonality to his, his falsetto and these with, with this production that's just creating this very, just kind of like taboo, societal underbelly like like everything about his music is saying we're not supposed to be doing this right now it's very like covert it's very <laughs> eyes wide shut and i remember the same time this uh this indie band uh wild beast came out with an album smother so my cousin pt and i were talking about how dark and how like forbidden those two albums, Smother and the House of Balloons mixtape, just kind of felt. It was just, it felt like a shift in the sound of indie and R&B. We'll call it indie R&B music. Like you could call it 
chamber, R&B, pop, or whatever you want to call it, something was taking place with that House of Balloons album. And I think the last 10 years is evidence that there was more than just that one initial flame, that he has actually had one of the best careers over the past decade from any artist of any genre. Like, you'd have to narrow it down to, like, what, Taylor Swift, Drake, uh, I don't know, Kanye West, Bruno Mars. It's a very, very short list in terms of who has had the type of success that The Weeknd has had. Uh, the Weeknd has six number one singles on the Hot 100. That's cross-genre to date. Six number one singles. To put that into perspective, Taylor Swift has seven number one singles. So yeah, The Weeknd is right there. I mean, Taylor Swift started her career. Her first uh, major album was in 2006. The Weeknd, again, he dropped House of Balloons in 2011. So in a few years less the time, he has only one fewer number one Hot 100 hit. So yeah, The Weeknd is right there in terms of like artists of the decade. If you're talking from 2011 to uh, 2020. So yeah, with this New follow-up to After Hours, Dawn FM, saddle up and just appreciate that you are in the midst of one of the best careers of the generation, of the era, the weekend, totally over-delivered. To be honest, I thought that this was going to be like a momentary sensation that was going to like flame out within like a couple or a few years, but no, here he is 10 years later, he's fresh off of that Super Bowl halftime show performance, he's hotter than ever and that is pretty damn remarkable. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to hearing what he's going to come up with on this Don FM album. Uh, supposedly, uh, reportedly, he's going to feature Tyler, the creator, who's been on a pretty hot streak himself, more so from a critical standpoint. But yeah, Tyler, the creator, Lil Wayne, the great legendary Quincy Jones in a uh, 10 tricks point never the kind of electronic ambient artist, uh, pretty good music. Uh, a lot of his early stuff was uh, instrumental, but it was very glitchy. Give 10 tricks point never a listen and uh jim carrey is supposed to be on this dawn fm album as well so yeah saddle up <laughs> i can't wait but yeah let me know what you think of the weekend what you think of his discography like were you up on his early like house of balloons like do you remember when that dropped and what it was like when it dropped and everything that he's done since then like once he hit that stride with that um beauty behind the madness album like, I knew that we were in for something different. Like, okay, this is going way crazier than I expected it to go career-wise. But yeah, leave your comments in the comments. And please, like the video, subscribe to the channel if you love music like I do. I'm Wood. Thanks for tuning in.